Welcome to the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. My name is Natalie Nidham. I am a holistic nutritionist, an epigenetic and a human potential coach, and a self-professed biohacker. In my day-to-day work and in this show, I am super passionate about helping people just like you learn about the latest and greatest tools that can help them to perform at their very peak today and for many, many years to come. In today's episode, I have the great pleasure of welcoming and interviewing Dr. Elizabeth Yurt. Dr. Yurt is the co-founder and medical director of the Boulder Longevity Institute, where she's been providing tomorrow's medicine today to her clients since 2006. So in, on top of her 25 plus years practicing orthopedic medicine, Dr. Yurt is board certified in both physical medicine and rehabilitation and anti-aging regenerative medicine. She's got a Stanford-affiliated fellowship in sports and spine medicine and a dual fellowship from A4M in anti-aging and regenerative medicine. She's also completed a fellowship in human potential and epigenetic medicine and is part of the first cohort of providers to receive the A4M National Peptide Certification, which obviously makes her quite the expert in peptides, which is what we're going to talk about today. Anyway, back to Dr. Yurt. She's also a faculty member and national lecturer for both A4M and the IPS Society, International Peptide Society. And finally, and this is amazing, this is someone who lives the life, walks the walk, talks the talk, as an athlete herself, who has dealt with numerous injuries, Dr. Yurt is thrilled to share with her clients all the innovative life-changing treatments that are on the cutting edge of medicine. I can tell you guys, I mean, yeah, I'm reading part of this, but I got to tell you, Dr. Yurt is this and more. So today's episode, we get to talk, we talk about circadian rhythm, we talk about DSIP, which is a great peptide for sleep that I think a lot of people misunderstand because they think they're going to use this peptide and fall asleep 10 minutes later, not quite the way it works. Um, And then we also talk, touch a bit on ARA 290 and in general, why sometimes people don't seem to get the results that they think they should get from the peptide therapies that they're using. So I hope that you enjoy this episode. I had a great time interviewing Dr. Yurt. I hope that I get to welcome her again. But in the meantime, here we are. Oh, and finally, to contact Dr. Yurt, if you want to reach out to her for anything or look into working with her at her clinic, it's the boulderlongevityinstitute.com. That's her website. So enjoy the show. Today, I have the great pleasure of welcoming Beth, Dr. Betsy Yurth to the podcast. Thank you so much, Betsy, for agreeing to be on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm always following you, stalking you on your Facebook and things. So I'm really kind of thrilled to be here and talk to you in person. Oh, great. Well, thank you. Well, uh, that's a little stressful. I hope I'm, I mean, I guess clearly I'm not saying anything too hideous out there. So you're willing to be on the show. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, okay. So, um, Dr. Yurth, Betsy, it owns two clinics in Boulder, Colorado. One is an orthopedics, specializes in orthopedics. And then the other one, which you're going to, I mean, because we talked about this a little bit way back, um, you then started one uh, that focuses on longevity and I'm going to call it healthy aging. I don't know if oh, it's anti-aging. Right. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, your, your start, your beginning and what brought you into this most fascinating world of peptides that we're in these days. Sure, because I did kind of get around, you know, from orthopedics to here, you know, uh, it's funny, I think Dr. Seeds and I are some of the, one of the few people who kind of went from that role. Most people are either internal medicine or emergency medicine, getting into more functional medicine. But what I found, so I've, I've, I've always kind of had a, a heavy sports practice, sports medicine practice. So for, I've been practicing orthopedics for 30 plus years. And with a heavy sports medicine kind of focus. And what I sort of, about 15 years ago, after being in practice for quite some time, I actually started just getting pretty frustrated with the injuries that never really quite got better or you would get somebody better and they would just come back again with the same thing a little bit later. And so I started really focusing a little bit more on, okay, how do you actually get people healthy so they don't just keep coming back and seeing me? And I also started to get a little bit more interested in you know, arthritis and how is that, you know, arthritic pain, you know, how is that more a functional disease and not just as we see it as orthopedists, a wear and tear phenomena? You know, orthopedic doctors are all about, oh, you know, you wear out your knee, let's replace it. Let's look at why you wear out your knee and try and catch those people early and stop that process. So I also start getting really interested in, in 
arthritis as a disease and not just a, a joint problem. And so went back, and this was back when American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine was a pretty small group. It was probably, you know, 5,000 people at the meetings. It was small. Went back and, and went to a meeting and thought, okay, this is it. This is my answer. I've got to understand hormones and nutrients and pathways. And so did the fellowships for A4M, uh, did fellowship in regenerative medicine, and started incorporating that into my orthopedic practice and rapidly found that you can't see patient in 15 minute blocks and incorporate hormones and nutrients and health into those blocks. And so that became a big frustration. So we opened about 15 years ago now, Boulder Longevity Institute, nice. where our focus is a lot more on exactly how do you stop the disease process before it becomes replacing your knee or having to you know, deal with a knee that's already completely worn out or a spine and looking at all these as disease processes and looking at, for instance, you know, how hormones, you know, why do women, for instance, start to get so much achier at menopause? Because we know progesterone is so key to joint health. Mm -hmm. So that really, you know, now sort of tore me into, I still have my orthopedic practice. Um, I get a little torn because I, sometimes I feel like I'm not doing those patients as much of service as I could if they could get them here. And do, a lot of my patients do move from there to here. Uh, because they want that kind of care. I, I sort of start exposing them to them. I start teaching them about inflammatory cytokines and joint health. And they, you know, there are a few who don't want to hear it. And there's a few who really become interested and come over here and become patients. So here we use a combination of, you know, hormones and, and peptides and nutrient supplements. And we look at the entire picture and spectrum of people. And we look at inflammatory cytokines and, and really try and address as, you, you know, as, 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 you do, we try and address the root cause of the problem. Totally. And as time's gone on, you, you know, we were learning more and more. It used to be diseases were looking at organ systems, you know, even in functional medicine realm. And now we're, you know, and then it, it, it came down to, you know, a little bit more of, of uh, the cellular level. And now we're kind of down to pathway level. And, and, and I know you have background in epigenetics and, and as do I, I worked, did some fellowship training in epigenetics too. And, um, and so you know, now we're looking down to the very root biochemical pathway level of things. And that's where, you know, for instance, peptides become such a key player because we can actually, I don't know if you recently saw an article that just came out that was looking at peptides effect on the epigenome and, you know, how many peptides are genetic modifiers. Um, and like so- Like GHK? <laughs> like GHK copper, right, you know, <laughs> exactly. You know, and, and, and even, Probably, I think we're going to find more and more of that, that we're going to see peptides probably, because there's so many things we don't understand about peptides. We know how, we know some of the things they do and how they work. And then there's these little, these little things they do that we just can't quite a grip on. And I think that's going to come down to looking at how it's changing DNA methylation and, you know, histone acetylation and things like that. And so, so that's, you know, so, so my, my background just keeps expanding and, and becoming more fascinated with these things and the things we can do um, to stop aging. Well, that's, I mean, that's truly amazing. And you know, it's interesting and listening to your path and it's so, you know, it speaks a little bit to the way the medical system is, I, I think it still is designed that way is to, is to create these really powerful practitioners that are very focused on this one thing and your journey. And I think the journey of so many functional medicine doctors is moving into this more you know, for lack of a better world, holistic practice where you're now dealing with the body as a complex system that of all these integrated parts and recognizing that, you know, I mean, like I have, you know, arthritis in this one joint of my finger and we could sit there and go, okay, that one thing, but really like, let's take a step back and figure out how we got there in the first right. place and what could be contributing to it. So I think that's, I mean, it's so fascinating and so Honestly, it's so inspiring <laughs> to see like the, the broadening of, uh, it's almost like we kind of got really, really tiny and now things are getting bigger. And within the lar the, this larger scope, you're now coming back down to a microscopic level, but on a much more personalized and with a different focus, if you will. And I, you know, I wonder with the peptides, to your point, if what they're also doing is acting as signaling molecules. And so the way I describe them to people often is, it's the way I imagine what peptides do is they, they kind of flip a switch. They upregulate body, the body's own ability to do whatever it is that 
the action is. And so it, it kind of initiates a cascade and you get these downstream effects. And that's where, you know, I wonder we're seeing some of these pleiotropic effects that we don't always understand where the cascade comes from. And to your point, we're still, you guys are still trying to figure out and understand what are the switches that the peptide or peptides are flipping as it were. Right, exactly. You know, and to your point, I, I would like to say I'm seeing all of medicine starting to take this more functional approach. It's still a very small sector, right? And, and um, you know, I, I have 15 orthopedic partners who scoff at everything I, you know, I do. Um, so unfortunately, I think it's, we're still sort of a, not quite the mainstream, right? And, and, and I think for, you know, for your listeners who are, who are, are working with medicine, it, it, there's, there's a little bit still frustration from a, you know, an economic perspective too, because you can't do this type of medicine in 15 minute blocks that, you know, that are insurance based. And you know, we're, gonna, we're gonna have to sort of see a transition in people's mindsets there too, that you know, put your health dollars to places so that you can spend them on people like you, like people like me, where we can actually sort of really help your overall health. Because unfortunately, insurance is going to pay for your total knee, you know, but they're not going to pay for the, the underlying disease process to keep that from happening. And, and even your arthritic total knee patient, just like your arthritic finger that you're talking about, is a sign of a systemic problem, right? There is some type of inflammatory problem that we should be addressing. And that same problem that's messing up your knee, you know, for instance, we know that very high levels of some of the inflammatory cytokines, interleukin 1 beta, for instance, that is messing up your knee is also increasing your, your risk of cancer and increasing your risk of dementia. So you know, really encourage your listeners to, to more clearly understand that that's why we are spending this time and energy and the amount of you know, education that you and I put into trying to learn all this stuff so that we can bring that to, to them. You know, that behind the scenes of, of, of the hour or sometimes two and three hours that I spent with my patients, you know, I just spent you know, 100 hours trying to learn what I'm to, to, to teach them. That you know, my partners went, you know, like I did. We went, we went through residency. You, you spent all this time learning, and then, then most of them actually kind of stopped learning. <laughs> yeah, isn't that amazing? It, 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 it blows my mind, right? To me, it's like getting into whatever aspect of healthcare. Like I'm not a doctor, but to me, the mindset has to be because if there's one thing you learn, and one thing I took away from my college studies when I studied human physiology was, we don't know. And so we're trying to figure it out as we go, and we have to be willing to go back and accept that we actually got this one thing wrong, which right. is everything else, which means that to get into any health field, you make a commitment to become a lifelong learner. Right. And, and, and shockingly, to your point, we don't see that as the norm. I mean, more and more, I think doctors like you, you know, like people like you who are coming to the realization there's a better way. There's, there's things we don't know and to open your minds. I'm a little bit shocked that your partners, like you would think that seeing the results that you get and seeing what you can accomplish, I'm a little shocked that they're still kind of scoffing at what you're doing, but what, you know, people are- I understand that it's, it, it, unfortunately, you know, preventing disease is not in the best interest of medicine, right? Yeah. Preventing disease is not in the best interest of the, the multi-million dollar industry that it is. You yeah. know, there's a lot of money in joint replacements. There's a lot of money in, in knee arthroscopy. There's a lot, you know, it's in spine surgery. Um, you know, you can make a lot of money doing a spine surgery and a lot, you know, it's, so it's not particularly in the best interest of, of them to actually want to prevent disease. And that's where the unfortunate, you know, problem with medicine is that it's not in the best interest of Look at the, the amount of money in drug companies, in, oh, yeah. in um, biomedical things to put to make a new device to fuse your spine. There's so much money there that is a threat yeah. to you know you and I who are trying to prevent those things from happening. And so that's that's something that that's going to have to be driven by um, by your listeners, by by us. That that you know that we don't want that. We want a different way. And that's you know that's what I hope this transition in medicine eventually becomes that people start taking control of their health. They say, you know, I don't want that. I want you to understand my disease and I want you to treat that. And I don't want you to just start focusing on, oh, let's in another couple of years, we'll be able to fuse your spine. Yeah, no kidding. And I think you're right. And I think, and what I'm seeing in my clients is people are, they're willing to take control 
and I think, and you you see this as well. It's and it's positioning it to people is this isn't an expense, this is an investment. This right. is an investment in your present, in your future, in how you're going to live your life. So once people start, you know, people spend a hundred thousand dollars on a car. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah I have that conversation <laughs> all the time. I just had a conversation. You know, she was asking the cost of this peptide program. And she said, well, right now I've got my Lexus, I'm paying off and I really can't afford that. And I'm like, yeah, maybe don't drive a Lexus and pay for your health, but. <laughs> yeah, like maybe you could be the Lexus and drive a golf. Yeah, right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what I thought. All my money goes into my health. You know, my, my car is not nice, my house is not nice, but, <laughs> but my refrigerator is full of peptides. <laughs> I've got a whole stash and I'm sending them to my poor parents. I'm like, okay, yes. And my mother's like, yes. <laughs> Anyway, listen, so we, I mean, when it comes to peptides, I, there's no shortage of topics we could talk about, but I think what we landed on for today, and it was partially driven by you, um, that you really wanted to talk about DSIP. And D DSIP is like this really interesting peptide that I think it's a very misunderstood peptide, partially because, you know, it's the, so it stands for Delta Sleep Inducing Peptide, I guess, it, right? And so it, 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 it enhances a certain phase of sleep. That is a phase where we repair and all this amazing thing, these amazing things happen. One of the biggest issues I see, and I'm sure that you see, is that people don't sleep or they don't sleep well. And if you don't sleep, nothing good's gonna happen in your world. Um, and, but it's also a tricky peptide because a lot of people don't respond to it very quickly. And, and we were talking about this offline, is that you know even with peptides, people have this expectation I'm going to use this peptide and poof, everything's going to be perfect. Everything's going to work. So I actually, to prepare for this, I probably should have started earlier, but I used DSIP last night. And I had this really interesting experience in that. I, so one thing I should say is I track my sleep with the Nora ring. Me too. Amazing. <laughs> um, and so... I had the we so I'm doing a lot of different things right now. I'm practicing alternate day fasting. I'm doing 20 to 30 minute cold baths um, once a day. Um, you know, I'm doing all these different things. And last night I did a sauna because that way I could at least get my head around getting into the cold bath. I just can't the cold yet. <laughs> it's kind of I love the sauna, the cold. I I, I try and do cryotherapy once a week, and I've been doing it for quite some time. And I keep thinking, okay, I'm going to start being okay with this. <laughs> yeah, cryotherapy is another. But, but the cold immersion, I can do cryotherapy way easier than I could do the bath. Yeah, like, yeah. Like getting all of me into cold water. Right. No, I don't have to do it. <laughs> anyway, I, anyway, so I'm doing all this stuff. I do my injection of the DSIP. You know, I think it was eight o'clock before eight it was probably seven forty-five. and if i did not wear my i mean i actually feel great today but when i opened my eyes this morning if you would have asked me how my night was i would have said it was the worst sleep ever because i was up and down like a yo-yo i felt like i was awake all the time i only knew that i was sleeping because i had these crazy dreams huh? but ironically my heart rate variability my recovery score this morning was literally the highest i've ever seen it was i was at 82. Now I've been high all week. I've been in 60s and 70s all week, which is already good for me. But 82, I've never seen. Yeah, really and, Yeah, and in spite of thinking like, feeling like I was awake all night, and now I feel refreshed today, so that's great. I got over an hour and a half of deep sleep and over an hour and a half of REM sleep. And REM sleep's been a struggle for me lately. So I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of putting it out there because this is one of those things that people would, they would try this DSIP and they. Not everybody would have the same effect as me, but they would wake up in the morning and they'd go, oh my God, that was brutal. I thought I was going to sleep like a rock and here I am. So why don't we talk a little bit about what you're seeing in your practice so, and what DSIP does? So I think that, you know, what DSIP does is complex because it's working on so many sort of different realms. Um, and I, I think when we sort of see, think of it as a delta sleep inducing peptide or deep sleep inducing peptide, and we know that it, you know, that it, it comes up in high levels before we go to sleep, but there's probably a lot more, more to it than that. And let me preface what, what kind of got, my, got me interested in talking about DSIP was that I recently gave a little webinar on circadian rhythm. 
And we're kind of finding that disruptions in circadian rhythm have so much play on health. Oh, yeah. And not just really even just sleep, but the timing you do everything, right? Which is probably why intermittent fasting or 16-8 fasting is so important because we're really not meant to eat all day long, right? We're not yeah. meant to eat little meals all day long. You know, the trainers here are still telling people eat every two hours. You know, well, that's not really what our bodies are designed to do. We're, we're meant to go long periods of time without eating. And so, you know, you have this sort of circadian clock all kind of run by the, you know, the super chiasmatic nucleus in your brain, but every cell in your body has its kind of own little circadian clock. And when those, and as do our organs, and when those get off kilter, we see disruptions in health, you know, yeah. from cancers and, you know, all sorts of things. So I sort of started becoming really fascinated as you, re as you start looking at circadian rhythms and, you know, there's the best time to take your medications. There's, there's the best time to have surgery. Right. That's right. That's right. Amazing. <laughs> I, I gave this webinar, right, and Lily, one of my partners, who's a foot and ankle specialist, you know, it's so obviously some of his patients have listened to my webinar, and now his poor medical assistant looks at me, she goes, why did you tell these people that they all have to have surgery at this time? You can't do everybody's surgery at this time. You know, and they're like, and they're like so, well, they said you said that, and I'm like, oh, I did it in my webinars. <laughs> so now she's like, she's like, you know, all the patients are like, yeah, no, Dr. Ear said I had to have my surgery at this time, and they're like, what? <laughs> What is, what is the perfect time for surgery? And um, I, I, I actually forget, it was 7.30 in the morning. It was actually, I think, the perfect time for your surgery. <laughs> of course, everybody couldn't be at that time. Um, <laughs> so there's kind of this perfect time for everything. You know, for instance, if you take an aspirin for health, you know, you should be taking that at night, not in the morning. So many people take an aspirin a day, you know, for overall health. And, and as you know, from a genetic standpoint, for some people it's good, and for some people maybe not. But the the... You know, but that, that, or if you take a statin drug, that should be taken at night. So there's the best time for little, literally everything, you know, and, and unfortunately it's, you know, because our sleep is probably not the way we're supposed to have gone to bed anymore, right? We're, we're, unfortunately, we're run by work and, and clocks and not our circadian rhythms anymore. That's very disrupted. And, you know, as you know, there's some, you know, the, the clock gene, the, the BML gene, they're so regulated by all of this. And then those are master regulators of so many other things. And so what really got me interested in, in all of this was how do we fix circadian rhythm in people? Because I can tell you sleep more, right? Go to bed at this time. I can tell you to intermittently fast. And those are all great things. But realistically, a lot of us can't do that, right? I, I, you know, your lifestyle, maybe because you're a night shift worker or because you have to travel for work. Or, you know, simply that, you know, that, that your, your schedule is, you know, is as great as you, as you can make it. It's just not going to enable you to sleep at this perfect time. And so what we started, started looking at is, you know, are there some biohacks, right, that we can do that maybe at least help restore some of the things that are going wrong yeah. when our circadian rhythms are disrupted. So it's not just using DSIP potentially to, to help deep sleep. Um, and to maybe help those insomniacs to sleep, but perhaps using thinking of it maybe that even if you don't feel like it it helps sleep, because we'll get into that a little bit, because I, I I will tell you it's not the cure all to my people who can't sleep, um, but it does appear to affect a lot of the bad things that happen when you don't have a normal circadian rhythm. Really? Okay. So so it a lot of the the things that it's doing it's like you know it's it's increasing superoxide dismutase. It's increasing glutathione peroxidase. It's, you know, so it's really, um, it has a, a, a protective effect on, on the hippocampus, which we know is one of the areas that's damaged when our circadian rhythms are off. Um, so one of the, if you look at some of the more recent research on DSIP, it's not really even about sleep. It's about all of its other kind of protective effects mm. in terms of sort of some anti-cancer effects, um, its effects, it, it, its effects on oxidative for, phosphorylation. So I think that that where I became interested in is can we use this maybe not just in our you know because what we what we've used it for in the past too is trying for those people who just can't sleep, mm -hmm. which is a huge problem. When you have these people who can't sleep, it is, it's you know, a, it is a huge problem. Yeah. And I will tell you my experience with DSIP and trying to get people to sleep has not always been great, right? It's <laughs> You know, some people do really well with it and some people it didn't help them sleep at all. Mm -hmm. I will say that if you measure deep sleep with the Aura Ring, and I do, you know, I'm sure you encourage your clients. I love the Aura Ring because you can, because you can look at your HRV 
and you can so eat, nicely track what something you did changed. Oh, I know. There's other things that we can do, right? Yeah. Um, that, that you see that kind of instantaneous, I did this and look what happened. Um, I had the same experience recently. I started taking SS31, a mitochondrial peptide. And, and, and I will tell you, you know, I do not sleep enough. I, you know, it's a, a big fault of mine. I know how important it is. I can preach it all day long. I just feel like I have too much to do. And so my, I, I would kill for an HRV of 60 because mine doesn't get anywhere close to there. <laughs> but but the, for the first time I ever, I saw it go way up using SS31. You know, and I will take a new supplement and do something new and, um, you know, and, and, and look for changes. And, you know, so, so, you, so it is a really cool way to kind of instantaneously track and to look at things like deep sleep. Mm -hmm. I do think DSIP does increase that, that deep sleep time, the, the brain clean out time. So yeah. even when your patients go, well, that's not helping me. I'm not sleeping any better. If you can really have them record deep sleep, you do see an improvement there. Yeah. Remember that that's the time because DSIP does get into the brain and that is the time that the, the brain, the lymphatic system in the brain opens up where we get, where we flush out all the bad stuff, where we repair the brain. So, so, so you really need that deep sleep. So I can, if I have my patients with an aura ring, I can say, look, yeah, I know you're still sleeping poorly. I know you still feel frustrated, but you're actually at, at least getting some of the protective benefits. So, so again, we're looking at the, the DSIP is doing something that's act, you know, and, and it's probably some of its effects, maybe genetically, and maybe on some of these other, like, like, like glutathione peroxidase and things like that, that are really protective to the brain. So maybe that those are the things that we need to focus on with DSIP. Well, well you bring up such a great point too, I think is um, that of sleep quality versus sleep quantity. And people right. think, oh, you know, I need to be in bed, like I need to sleep for nine hours or 10 hours. There's actually some interesting research out there that shows that it's actually a U curve, that sleeping too long can be almost as much as the negative as sleeping too little. And it's, it's learning to hit that sweet spot. But within that, it's, I mean, it's like anything else, it's quality over quantity. It's getting into deep sleep. It's moving right. through the phases of sleep so that your body and your brain can regenerate while you're sleeping kind of thing. Because I mean, if you're getting crappy quality sleep, you can be there for nine hours. It, you're not going to, it's exactly. not doing anything. You never, you never had deep sleep. Yeah. yeah I have a little gal who works in my orthopedic office who, you know, she sleeps a good eight hours, but she's getting literally five minutes of deep sleep. I can sleep four hours and get an hour and a half of a deep sleep, and I can feel pretty darn good. You I'm have two deep sleeps? <laughs> I, I, it is my biggest fault is I, I feel, I, I read a lot. I feel like I'm, you know, I, I have two practices. I, <laughs> um, five children. And so oh, my, my, my life is kind of my, my, I'm, I'm working on it. Um, <laughs> been working on it for a long time. I'll keep working on it. But, but you're right. It really is critical. And I can tell the difference if I got four hours of sleep and only got 30 minutes of deep sleep, I feel completely different than if I got an hour and a half. So, so you are right. We have to look at, at, at quality. And we also just have to look at, you know, the protection that we can get mm -hmm. from using some of the, these things. So again, I, you, somebody has to work at night in the hospital, right? You have to have this staff, you have to have people, unfortunately, who we, you know, everybody can't live in this perfect world. And, you know, and I, I think that that's, you know, we can, and you're right. First thing we should always preach is good diet, good exercise, good sleep. Sure. Yeah, but, but it's not realistic for everybody that, that, that they can live in that perfect little world. And so I do think sometimes we have to help them around with that, you know, just like you're, you're going to be working sometimes you know, from your realm with people who have these genetic anomalies that we're gonna have to say, we have to use something to, mod to modify that. Um, I will also tell you that the DSIP is interesting that, in that some people do much better with taking it in the morning to help with sleep than at night. Well, I've heard that. So how's that? So one thing that I read is that it's got this minuscule half-life. Like it's there one minute and literally gone the next. Yes. I mean, it's in your system for literally 15 minutes. Right. You know. so meanwhile, in that 15 minutes, this intrepid little teeny tiny little protein <laughs> makes right. this across the blood brain barrier. And this is where we get into this world of flipping, like I, was, I describe it as flipping switches or initiating a cascade. And in that 15 minute window, it has somehow managed to hone in on wherever it is it's going, flip, initiate a cascade and move things in a certain direction. So that is one thing I was thinking, like I was wondering, should I try it 
earlier in the day because I mean my sleep's good. Right. You know, I'm, I sometimes I'll get two hours of deep sleep. My REM is is the one that that I'm struggling a bit more yeah. these days, and I'll keep playing with DSIP to see whatever. But one of the other things that I read about it is that it actually has an effect on LH, on luteinizing hormone, and Okay, so now we're getting into hormones and even growth hormone, which is interesting right. to me because CJC epimorelin makes me blow up like a, like I get itchy and like I get this crazy reaction. I can't use it. So I'm always looking for something that's going to give me that without the allergic reaction <laughs> part. Um, Have you tried then, just using epimorelin without CJC? So I was just thinking about that the other day. That's the one thing I haven't done yet. Yeah, do that because... Some people, you just, you know, CJC is very stimulating. You know, very few people, we have people who just can't take CJC. We have people who react to it. We have people who it creates. I have one patient who literally gets skin, you know, like little skin cancers every time they put on CJC, but ipamorelin um, doesn't really cause any of that. So ipamorelin is, is, you know, is much, it, you won't see people have reactions to it. It's much more stabilizing. You're not going to get quite the, the bump in IGF, as you will. But it still is a cool, really nice anti-aging effect. You're still going to get some benefits of increased growth hormone, increased IGF, um, without getting that kind of reaction. So, so that's we put a lot of people just on any of our people who are really, you know, immune reactive, cancer patients. We just put on ipamorelin. Um, so it's a much better way to go if you have those people who are kind of immune reactive uh, to a lot of things or have autoimmune, yeah, stuff. No um, autoimmune, just immune reactive. Anyway, let's get back to DSIP. LH, testosterone, growth hormone. Can we talk? Right. About so okay. that's what you know. So it, so it, so it does a couple. So it increases growth hormone, increases luteinizing hormone. So hence, you're going to get some increased testosterone production, um, and it increases somatostatin. So, right. so that's also a nice benefit, right? Because now you're going to to help with muscle building mm -hmm. by blocking somatostatin. So it's a nice somatostatin, you know, um, inhibitor. So that's another really good benefit of it. So that that's where it has some some nicer, far-reaching benefits. It's a nice way to modulate growth hormone at night, um, you know, and, and maybe again, taking it in the morning for that purpose might actually be better. It, it's a little difficult and you kind of have to experiment with people because I think this is where, you know, when we, you know, you and I have both studied, studied epigenetics I, we're, we're still, and we are learning a lot about hormones and epigenetics. We haven't really gotten too much into peptides and epigenetics yet, but it's where we're going to start having to focus a little bit more is to understand you know, so that because it may be your clock gene or your BML gene right. that that's when you should be taking this, right? Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. But lots of our patients, we, we had one guy who literally has seen a billion people for sleep and, you know, and DSIP at night did nothing for him. But in the morning, he felt more alert during the day and he slept really well at night. So it's, it, you know, it's diurnal, it's kind of restoring this diurnal variation of, of, of you know, from maybe a genetic perspective, it's sort of changing some of these things. So yeah, so I, I encourage you more using it. If it's not, if if you're not feeling like it's helping deep sleep um, or sleep at all, try taking it and see if that if, if that doesn't help more. Now dosing on it is difficult. That you know we sort of say 100 microgram dosing on most people on it, but um, some of the research has shown considerably higher doses for some people. You have to use you, you know a, a higher dose, and so I think that that people who aren't getting a result too, we can experiment with with changing the dose on it as well. Okay. Um, you know, going up, you know, you can go up, you know, and try 200, 300, 400, 500. I think that that's, you know, that's also some, something to kind of look at in, in using this. I think, um, but I do think when you look at some of those underlying benefits that we know are happening, yeah, you know it does all these things, you know, for, for LH, FSH core, for, for our detoxification pathways, mm -hmm. uh, for improving oxidative phosphorylation, for, for increasing, you know, as it really is a nice potent antioxidant. I think that those are some of the things that get so disrupted when our circadian rhythms are disrupted. And so using that potentially to restore it, just like melatonin might not always be the sleep inducing aid that people want. But it does so much more. Huge benefits, right? Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. fact that you're not producing melatonin when your circadian rhythm is off, well, if you take melatonin, you're like, okay, that didn't help me sleep. But I can tell you that melatonin has huge benefits in an inflammatory cytokine pattern, right? Yeah. So DSIP may this may be the same thing. That okay, we're not, even if you're not seeing it have the great benefits from sleep, the fact that you have probably a disrupted um, circadian 
circadian rhythm and you don't have as much DSIP, because we know we, there's, there is less levels of DSIP in cerebral spinal fluid in people who, who aren't sleeping well. We know it, in people who have severe depressions, there's, there's lower levels of DSIP. So we know that this, this is influenced by circadian pathways. So let's go back and at least put back the things that are messed up so that we can at least restore health in some of these people. You know, I, I think that that's maybe a different way of looking at things that sometimes we're always focused on, you know, get people to sleep, get people to sleep, get people to sleep and trying every single drug in the book. And maybe the focus should be on how do we restore the things at least while we're trying to get there. Again, I know people want to sleep, but trying to get there, how do we fix the problems that are occurring that we know we're, we're seeing, you know, hippocampal problems when people aren't sleeping. We, yeah. we know we're seeing, you know, um, disruption redox pathways. So I think that that's, that's why you really look at DSIP as, a, as an option. But experimenting with timing, some people work at dinner time, some people write you know, half hour before bedtime, and some people in the morning. So that's, you know, for your listeners who are, who are, who are really trying to use it for sleep, I encourage you, if you tried it and didn't have any benefit, take it at night, try taking it in the morning, see what happens, or try taking it even two hours earlier and see what happens. Yeah. Um, and again, recording what's happening with your sleep. And then like you and I talked about, you know, giving it a little bit of time too. Mm -hmm. if, we're, if we're changing, if you look at some of the things that it might be doing, um, where we're work, working actually back to the epigenetic perspective of it, some of those changes are going to take some time. And so whenever you try a peptide, don't just try it for three nights and go, well, oh, that was horrible. Unless you had obviously some horrible effects. You know, give it a good six week trial. Some things need 12 week trials. And I know that, that sometimes it's cost prohibitive, but you've got to sort of sort of dedicate yourself to going, okay, I'm gonna give this an ample shot. And, and mm -hmm. that's at least six weeks, you know, and, and some peptides a full 12 weeks to really know. But play with the dosing, play with the, play with the timing, uh, you know, and, and, and play with, with adding other things along with it. You know, so in, for instance, in increasing growth hormone at night, that's helpful. But if you can increase growth hormone a little bit more at the same time, so now we're, you know, we're, we're getting some improvement in growth hormone secretion using the, the um, DSIP, and then we can add on ipamorelin. Mm -hmm. With somebody like you, you add on ipamorelin so that you, you get that growth hormone release surge a little bit more at night, and that's gonna help you sleep better and get more deep sleep as well. So playing with you, using it in combination with things as well. Yeah, well, the idea of stacking, right, which, right. We, do, right. which we kind of, in this biohacking world of ours, right. but, but also, to your point, doing it at a pace where you have, you, given, you give the one thing enough time to assess it before you add the next thing. I mean, I think what we're all guilty of doing is trying something for one or two days and going, yeah. oh, I'm going to add this, and then I'm going to add that, right. and then have no idea. What right. the thing. But, you know, one thing I wanted to mention, now I'm going to give a little bit of a shout out here to a good friend of mine who is, um, she's an ER nurse in the US, and she goes by the night shift biohacker, and she is devoting her feed and all of the work she does to biohacking night shift work. And Super I think- interesting, right? Yeah, because it's definitely talked about- you know, So much you can do. Yeah, I mean, and you have to. Yeah, oh yeah, for your, for your toast. There are people who have to work at night. Our, yeah. our week is not set up to the whole world just to shut down at night. And so, you know, as much as we tell everybody, you've got to sleep completely in the dark and, you know, and you have to, you have to eight hours and you really need to be sleeping during these times. It's not realistic for everybody. And so we do have to look. So that's really, that's really cool that she's doing that because there, there's this whole group of people that, you, you know, are listening to us preach doing all this and going, well, I can't do that. And you're like, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. It's going to be at a weird time. And, you know, and, and, and so you have to use these kind of hacks to, to figure out how you're going to protect your health. Because we know night shift workers have poor health. We know they have higher rates of cancer, considerably higher rates of cancer. And so, so yeah. we have to sort of look at those people. And all of us have gotten a little bit into that, right? We, we, you know, most of us are not going to bed. Our, our world doesn't go, now you don't go to bed at eight o'clock at night, right? It's just not, you know, that's, you would have very little social life if you do that. I mean, maybe there are some people who do, but most of us, you know, are staying up later than truly our, initial, our original circadian clocks of, you know, were designed to. So, you know, I think that, that using some of these, these, these sort of new things that are available to us is going to enable us to sort of restore our health, you know, despite something that the world around us. We can't stop that we're exposed to tons of toxins and, you know, right. and fires and, you know, yeah. and, and so we have to look at how do we increase detoxification pathways because
because we can't stop the fact that you know the world's on fire, but we can help our bodies to be able to to, to deal with that better, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think I loved what you said about how DSIP, and it again, it speaks to not always being so focused on the on the outcome, on the visible outcome but understanding that there's other stuff going on in the background that is helping you and benefiting you that you may not, you may not know, you may not notice right. that it's happening. Right. And it's a bit like melatonin. I wanted to ask you something about melatonin actually, because, you know, seeing as we're talking about epigenetics and stuff like that, you have these people that say they can't take melatonin because they're slow metabolizers of melatonin. And it's for them, like they wake up in the morning on their knees, like they can't get out of bed, like because they're so slow at process, at, clearing it out of their systems. So for those people to get the health benefits of melatonin, would you ask them to maybe take it earlier in the day, just like we're doing with the DSIP, so that they have more time to process it, whether it helps their sleep or not, it may actually more so take it. Right, exactly. Plus they get those other benefits of the, of the oxidative protection and all that stuff. Exactly. In fact, a lot of patients I have put, you know, I have patients who tell me that, well, actually, and I will use some high dose melatonin in my arthritis patients because you know we now know that osteoarthritis and degenerative disc disease have a big link to interleukin one beta, and one of the really good things to block interleukin one beta is high dose melatonin. Melatonin in general, but as you get to a higher dose, like up to twenty milligrams, you can really block interleukin one beta. And interleukin one beta actually, so you know we get injured all day long. You know, you get injured bending over, you get injured making your bed. Those are tiny injuries that occur, and, and you know, interleukin one beta. Every time you have one of these little things that causes a little, tiny bit of inflammation, it cascades, it gets into the cell, and starts this whole process. But if you make a lot of interleukin one beta, so genetically you just pour out interleukin one beta, and you don't dampen it, you don't have the other anti-inflammatory side to dampen it down. It it actually gets into the cell, it upregulates something called the NLRP3 inflammasome, which we know is linked to a bunch of diseases, and that's a, that causes mitochondrial death. You see rapid degradation of discs and, and cartilage. So we know that melatonin, in fact, they did a great rat study uh, maybe six months ago where they actually put a tiny pinhole in the disc of rats. And they, these rats were bred to have high interleukin one beta. The, the disc immediately degenerated, just went from you know, a nice normal disc to a degenerate disc. And when they blocked the interleukin one beta, that didn't happen at all. In fact, they preserved a completely normal disc, and they also could reverse some of the degeneration of the disc um, with just putting them on melatonin. So really? by blocking the interleukin one beta. So we've been putting a lot of our arthritis patients and degenerative disc patients on 20 milligrams of melatonin, and people will say, "Oh, I can't take that. You know, melatonin either makes me too sleepy, or it makes me, you know, gives me dreams." So you have to take it in the morning. They do fine, actually. Huh. Um, and I'm one of those people who. You know, um, inter interesting. So, if I take like three or five milligrams of melatonin, I feel really groggy the next day. If I take twenty milligrams, I don't. You know, it's probably has something to do with the receptors. You know, but the and so so it's interesting that that you can get that uh, uh, more awakefulness from it during the day, and then get to sleep at night. You see, so you can have them take kind of a high dose in the morning, and they'll actually feel really good during the day. They'll have lower inflammation, they'll feel better, and then they actually have a nice sleep at night. So 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 a lot of those people. Um, that's that's the route you can take with them, and then people are shocked by that, and they try and like, oh, it actually worked. Um. That's amazing. And so, what do you say to people? Because I have, I mean, I I think most people should be taking melatonin because we just stop making it as we age. I mean, we just our production goes down, and people are like, yeah, but if I take melatonin, then my body's not going to make it anymore. And I'm kind of like, well, your body's not making it anymore anyway. <laughs> I think it's, that's similar to hormones, right? Yeah. Uh, you get that with hormones all the time too, where people, yeah. you know, people are like, "Well, I, you know, I'm, I want to keep making my own hormones." I said, "Well, you know, we're going to just add enough to it." Now, if we supersaturate receptors, you know, are we going to blunt your own production? Yeah, you know, probably over time. So you can, you can, you can just like take laxatives, you can take breaks from it. Um, so you know, so don't do it every day, every night. You can do it like five nights a week, or do it for you know cycles, like six weeks, and then take a couple of weeks off. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can also do things like using epitalon to try and regulate your own melatonin. You know? I love epitalon. Yeah. <laughs> you to say. Uh, so, you know, so that's, and that can sometimes sort of help regulate your own melatonin. And, you know, Dr. Steve's and I, you know, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't like high dose melatonin, he likes using epitalon instead. I'm, I'm not certain you're going to get the same, the same big benefit of melatonin from it. Um, 
that, that you will from just taking melatonin. And again, when you, I will tell you, we're seeing marked improvements in people, particular spines, you know, degenerative backs with using melatonin. You know, two things are really good interleukin one beta blockers are epigallocatechins, so what's in green tea, EGCGs in green tea, and then, and then melatonin. We put people on those and it's marked how much improvement you'll see. And people were like, you know, yeah, and you know, and degenerative disc disease is a hard thing to treat and right. It's like yeah. you do, you know. And um and, and people said more how much EGCG are you giving them? About uh, six hundred milligrams. Uh, yeah. so I use much higher doses of that in my cancer patients, for instance. Right. You know, you're really high doses. You have to get to super high doses, you have to watch liver functions. If you right. stay at like a six hundred milligram dose, you seem to get a nice anti inflammatory benefit from it, protective benefit and not have to really worry about liver. So I, I think ideally more is better. <laughs> and epigallic has has so many huge benefits right. for cancer prevention, but even for muscle building and performance and you know, all sorts of things. Um, but, but I think you've got to watch the liver and, and it, 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 we all fall into that power. We're taking it a billion things, right? And so you can't overwhelm the liver too much. Um, but yeah, so, so if you use that combination of the two, it's really helpful. You know, but that kind of takes us the whole back to that, you know, when you look at that melatonin is, well, why are we seeing, you know, so much more arthritis in people than we used to? And, you know, and we're not really more active. We're not, you know, our farmer, you know, our, our, you know the, the farmers who were out there in the fields, we didn't see the kind of arthritis we see now. So some of that really is this disruption in, in, in that we don't make this nice protective agent anymore. Well, that's, you know, well, it comes back to your first point of circadian disruption. Like it right. all comes back down to that. Right? You can, it's, if you start looking at circadian rhythm, you can link every disease almost to circadian rhythm disruptions. And, you know, and, and we've gotten so far away from living the way we should be, in, you know, or eating the way we should be. I mean, I don't know how much you argue with your patients whose trainers still tell them, eat every two hours. Oh, you gotta keep your metabolism. You've gotta eat every two hours. I, I mean, I, I argue that point so often i'm like you well, i don't you argue anymore I'm like, I'm like you hired me it's my way <laughs> i'm a bit of a bully that way i'm like you know what i mean you know for some people that i find they're so dysregulated when they come in and they're riding this insane roller coaster of blood sugar and insulin all day long i have to put them on like temporarily until i can fix the diet so it becomes a little lower glycemic so we can get them off the roller coaster. I have to allow them the snacks, but I'm like, just so you know, this is temporary. You are, you know, I was listening to a Jason Fung video last night and he makes me laugh. Like he's the fasting guy. And he goes, you know, so we send kids out playing soccer and then we chase them around the field with granola bars because they need <laughs> what the hell. Like they don't need a granola. Yeah. You're fine. It's so <laughs> ingrained, right? Uh, you know, it's <laughs> You know, snack, right? You gotta have a snack. But, you know, it's all, that comes from like a nurturing thing. My my ninety six year old mother was dying recently, and you know she's really on her death. But I'm still trying to feed her. I'm like, come on, eat. Why? It's like there's just something so ingrained in us to like feed. <laughs> oh, I know, I know, and you know, like this whole idea of not eating. Anyway, let's let's we'll stay on topic here because I mean I'm happy to fall down the next rabbit hole as much as the next guy. So one other thing I wanted to ask you about DSIP, and then we have a few minutes, we're going to talk about one other peptide briefly. And it said, I read something about it, how it re relieves excitatory no toxicity via the glutamate receptors, which is really interesting to me because that's a pathway we see, like it's a big deal in autism, like in, right? So yeah, all those neuroexcitatory path pathways, it, they, they've actually, um, I think there's actually a patent now, a study uh, for epilepsy, uh, you know, for the same thing, because it really seems to, you know, reduce that, that, that hyperexcitability of the brain, of the neurons in the brain. And so they actually found it to be super successful in some childhood epileptics who were really hard to control. Wow. For that same reason, by probably reducing glutamate and reducing this neuroexcitability. Um, also really neuroprotective if you have like a brain injury or, or you know, a, a trauma, you know, you look at the, the um, you know, somebody has a bad concussion, it's probably a good thing to pull out. And, you know, and that probably has, has a lot to do with that whole, uh, because it, it, it's, it does cross into the blood-brain barrier. It yeah. restores that deep sleep period when the blood-brain barrier becomes, becomes able to be cleaned out, right? So you can actually sort, right. of, sort of, you know, change the whole glutathione peroxidase pathways and oxidative phosphorylation pathways. And so it probably has to do exactly with, with that whole piece of, of restoring that period of time when we actually can 
get rid of the bad stuff in the brain, help the brain to recover and heal. I think that's the time when we heal our brain. Is deep yeah. And so if you can restore that, you can recover the brain. So yeah, they used it, I think in, in the um, epilepsy study, they used it um, in like, they tried different timings of it. And I think it actually worked better in the epilepsy group to, to do it in the morning. Um, you know, most seizures occur when people are groggy, right? Sleepy. That's why when we are testing EEGs, we do them sleep deprived, you know, but um, so, so when, you, when people are sleepy, so they found that they did in the morning, then as people went on during the day, they had much less seizure activity just by doing ACSIP in the morning. And so um, I think that there's still a, a stage two research study, unless it disappeared for some reason going on, using it, using it for the difficult to treat epileptics. You know, also really interesting, I was just reading a study yesterday on, um, so, so this is really interesting for, on breast milk. And so, you know, and they were looking at the components of breast milk throughout the day. So, you know, every hour of the day, measuring breast milk and looking at the carbs, the fats, the proteins, but also DSIP, uh, melatonin, cortisol in it. And, you know, and interestingly, things fluctuate throughout the day. And DSIP is in very, very high amounts of breast milk, but mm -hmm. particularly in breast milk first thing in the morning and then at night. So there was very high levels of it first thing in the morning, but then it would go up at night. And, and we know that, you know, breast milk, when babies nurse, they, they fall right asleep, and maybe that's the DSIP. Um, we also know that babies really need a whole lot of neural protection. They've got a lot of stuff going on. And so that's probably one of the reasons DSIP is in such high, high amounts. But one of the interesting things is, right, all of us who, you know, went back to work early and were pumping breast milk, so our babies got breast milk that was from different times of the day. So breast milk is probably very much designed to be given at certain times of the day. And that, that one of the starts of our circadian rhythm disruptions was from either bottle fed, which you don't get any. So breast fed is probably still better than bottle fed because at least you get some stuff. But if you were nursing versus, you know, versus being bottle fed with breast milk, those kids appear to have much more circadian rhythm disruptions than the kids who actually. So now I guess if you pump, you have to mark your breast milk as to what hour of the day it should be given to. <laughs> well, that that's insane. Well, so I um, I was well. I, my son was a preemie. Like he was born at twenty eight weeks. Uh -huh. Oh, so he couldn't nurse for the right. first. I don't know. I guess I, I want to say for the first until he got big enough. Like it took him right, a right. to even hit a stage. But um, but that's so. And and you know, it's interesting with those guys because they're in such an artificial environment to begin with. Right. Yeah. You, Lights, yeah. If you think about it, like it's the worst place on the planet, and yet somehow these tough little things. Yeah, they make they somehow make it. Right. They make it work. They figure it out. But that is so fascinating. And you know, I, I remember learning in school that, and and it's the value of breastfeeding for women who can, and that is how your milk changes based on the baby's needs at that time. Like it, it gets more rich when they're going through a growth spurt. It gets yeah. more liquid when you know they're congested or something like i just find that whole chemical interplay between the mother and child so fascinating so it's that is amazing but that even you know you're looking at things like like dsip and melatonin even from that very square one and that we actually started screening you know so all my kids are you know and i and i all my kids were were, were bottled but breast milk but you know i went back to work really early and so they, you know they probably got breast milk in the middle of the night you know first thing in the morning and so i'm like <laughs> probably all of them are poor sleepers well, they've all, they've all survived, right? They've all survived. It's going to be okay. <laughs> and besides, even if that hadn't messed up their sleep, computers, phones. Right, something else would have right. done it. So I think we can right. absolve ourselves of, de of, of guilt, and at least we gave them right. <laughs> we got that going for them. Okay, so, I mean, I'm sure we could keep talking about the SIP, but I did want to touch on one last thing, and I know we're running short on time, but one of the things we talked about was ARA 290, and maybe... Someday you could come back and we could do a whole other episode on something else. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to come back. You know, I want to talk about GHA Copper too. So, you know, yeah, yeah, no, there's so much. But, about, it's a peptide I love. It's a very underutilized. But ARA 290, which is, you know, it's sibinitide. It's actually a drug that's out there for small fiber neuropathy and sarcoidosis. So, it's actually you know, been through phase three trials. It's available with an orphan drug status um, for people with sarcoidosis and small, small fiber neuropathy. And we've used it quite a bit. Uh, and I know, I, I know there's been frustration from some, some of the people you talk to that they're just not seeing the results. And I, I think that I would express somewhat of the same frustration. 
partly because I've tried to pull it out for a whole lot of different nerve problems. And, right. You know, patients who have had nerve injuries post-trauma or post-surgery, um, you know, to try and get some, some repair. People who have odd neuropathic pain, you know, that we can't quite figure out. And I haven't seen great results with it for that. Now, that said, in small fiber neuropathy, which is where it really got its true test, yeah. Um, so a diabetic peripheral neuropathy, and most of those are small fiber neuropathies, not all, but most, um, you know, the small fiber neuropathy is associated with some neurotoxins like chemotherapeutic agents, lots of times we call yeah. small fiber neuropathies. In that group of people, I think it works very well. And it really is a six, you know, four milligram dose, six week course. And after six week course, you get enough repair that you, you know, you, you see long-term improvement. It's not a drug you, sh you should have to keep going on. You can repeat it. So then we'll, take a break and we will repeat it. So if people said, yeah, I definitely got better, but I'm not quite there yet, then we'll do another course of it. Um, but there are, if you don't see, it's not one of those peptides, I think if you don't see improvement in six weeks, you're probably not going to see improvement. And it probably means what you're treating was not really exactly what ARA was designed to treat. Right. Um, you know, it does have some other benefits. It's, you know, in, in, in kidney patients, for instance. So in patients who have, have poor kidney function, um, people who have polycystic kidney disease, that you can see improvement in kidney function using ARA as well. So it does have some other pretty significant benefits. Um, you know, they, they've, I know like chronic, people with fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia has, has a lot of etiologies. And I do think, I mean, they, they have determined that some of those people do have a type of small fiber neuropathy. And so I've tried it in some fibromyalgia patients with pretty limited success. I think that's because it's such a complex disease with so much going on that that you 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 may be, you may be targeting just a small piece of it when you when you're using ARA. But I will say, if you truly have you had chemotherapy, you know, and you have a neuropathy left over from that, you have a disease process that truly is a small fiber neuropathy, and you have neuropathic pain associated with that. Um, we've seen pretty good results with it with those patients. So I think the people who are RNC results are probably trying to use it out of its spectrum a little bit. Okay. I do think it's a peptide we'll find more uses for. Yeah. Because it does, it, it is a kind of cool peptide, and I do think we'll find more uses for it as time goes on. Like a lot of these things, it is a, you know, your all your listeners and you know, and 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 the physicians who are using these things kind of putting our knowledge together and 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 you know, that's why I love when you know I watch all the Facebooks and Reddit posts on people talking about peptides because you actually you learn. Know, Sometimes people spread not such good knowledge, but but at least you hear people's experiences, right? Yeah. And and you hear what people are trying because it sometimes is a lot of what we do is unfortunately self experimentation on things, you know. And the nice thing about peptides is they're pretty safe to do that with for the most part. Uh, so actually, so you mentioned six weeks for the ARA, which is interesting because a lot of what I've read and seen has been four weeks. The, the study that they did on, on the patients, with, I think it was fiber, small fiber neuropathy, uh, yeah, but, was a 28 day. But it's interesting that you're speaking to a, a better cycle being six weeks. As yeah, I think a six week cycle is a good trial of it. Okay. Um, really. So we put our patients on a six week trial, a six week cycle, and usually a six week cycle. You know, and again, in small fiber neuropathy people, we've seen some really nice results. We've had some patients who loved it. I mean, you know, Amazing. Who yeah. really loved it. It was, you know, people who have had, had some horrible diabetic neuropathy, neuropathic pain, and and it, it was it was marvelous. And six weeks course, and you know, and three months, four months later, they're still doing well. That's so um, I do think it's it, it's and again, sometimes you have a neuropathy and you don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, it, unless you had a nerve biopsy, do you know what kind of neuropathy it is? You might not. Yeah. You know, you know, a lot of drugs cause small fiber neuropathy. We know we know diabetes does, but a lot of neuropathies we really don't know the etiologies of. And so I think it's, you know, the downside of trying it without really knowing is the cost, right? Yeah. Um, it's expensive yeah. to try. And, and so, but if you really are truly having horrible neuropathic pain, it's probably worth it. It's probably worth trying and seeing. But I will say that I, I don't think if you, you know, if you did six weeks, you should say, okay, well, I'm not there. I'll try another six weeks. I'm probably not going to see benefit if you didn't see benefit after six weeks. Okay. Um, I, so I had one last question on DSIP, and then maybe we'll wrap it up for this time. And that was, how long do you think people should use it? We talked about maybe cycling it so that you're not, you know, just in case. I mean, I'm a big, big fan of pulsing things. Like, yeah, I agree. You know, turning it off, turning it on, turning it off. Exactly. I, I think almost everything is, you know, there's a few things I stay on all the time. I always stay on CJC and NIPA, you know, a five-day, two-day, two-day on, two-day off. 
I always say MVPC, just because I feel so much better on it. <laughs> um, but you know, most things that else I'm kind of cycling on and off, turning on and turning off. Um, and I think DSIP, I think once you get some restorative, I think you are going to get some restorative properties from it. I would do a 12 week course of it. And then I would, I would, start, I, I would try taking a six week or 12 week course off of it. Um, so I would probably try doing a 12 week course of it because I think it takes that 12 weeks to make some sort of dynamic changes. And in, in, in again, I think this may come back to what we're going to find with where it's, where it's changing things from a more DNA methylation perspective. I think we're going to see that, that maybe there's a lot of mechanisms of action of DSIP we don't quite understand. And I think we're going to find that that maybe where its root is, is coming back to, its, to some of the genetic or epigenetic changes. And I think that that 12 week course gives you ample time to make some changes that may stick with you then for a while, that we've made some adjustments. But again, if you're a shift worker or something like that, and we need some of the other protective benefits of it. And, and um, I think that that's something you're going to want to maybe do 12 weeks on and then just a six week course off and 12 weeks on because you're probably going to need it. Yeah, and then and couple it with the melatonin as we. Oh well, yeah, and and again and, and again, I I think melatonin is something I you know I have my my patients do regularly. I just keep them on the melatonin. Yeah. No, I just but I we just will measure inflammatory cytokines in people, and especially if you see, you know, so we you know we do a a, a panel called the CytoDX panel that you actually look at the pro-inflammatory and the anti-inflammatory cytokines. So you you know oh they're really high interleukin six person or they're really low interleukin ten person. And, and so you can really target these interleukins to try and balance inflammation on a lot of those people. And when you see higher interleukin one beta, those people will just sort of keep on. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. Well, we could keep talking, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you do have a job that you have to get to, patients to see, problems to solve. <laughs> so um, why don't we, um, I, you know, I think, I think I'll just finish with, with one last little question from you, and that is, and this is going to be a horrible question because it's going to be asking for you to pick your favorite child. <laughs> <laughs> if there was a peptide that you had to name as your favorite peptide, what would it be and why? Uh, it has to be thymus and alpha-1, quite frankly, because yeah. it's such a, I use it for so many things in so many people. And before you do anything, right, before you upregulate anything, you have to get the immune system in order, and that's everything. And thymus alpha-1 is so immune modulating and so protective. If you think about, you know, one of the big pieces of aging is, you know, the evolution of our, thy of our thymus gland, and you know, yeah. lo losing our thymic peptides is probably one of the big pieces of aging. I think replacing thymus alpha-1 is just huge. And we will, lots of times, it is the first peptide we start, we do nothing but thymus alpha-1 for at least a six-week course, because there are a lot of people like, like you, yeah, you put them on CJC and if 90% of people are going to be fine. There are going to be those people who, who react. And if you can get the immune system a little more regulated, you know, immune regulation is, controls everything. And, and so we will, a lot of times, that's our go-to peptide. It's my go-to peptide for, you know, any kind of illness somebody comes with. So many pieces of our, of our, our so many parts of our disease processes have to do with immune dysregulation. So I, I, I'm just enough of one is, and, and so I have a little bit of an autoimmune disease. Um, and so I, I always stay on a low dose of thymus alpha one. I will up it when I start to get sick or something bad happens, but I always stay on a low dose of it. Yeah, no, it's, I've actually, my parents, I had them uh, load up in March of this year. Yeah, and every, every week they do their, yeah. their yeah, one, we did. one shot. I have my whole family on it, you know, my youngest is 13. Um, and it's so funny because you know, he goes to the refrigerator and he gets the needle out and he gives himself an injection. <laughs> <laughs> the other day, my older son had friends over and Jason goes and you know pulls the, the peptides out of the refrigerator. And I'm like, Jason, probably not a great thing to be doing in front of us. <laughs> Can we just not do that in front of people? Getting needles out of the fridge and injecting yourself. I, you know. But yeah, you know, we had all of our patients taking time to one during the whole you know, COVID stuff and you know, really encouraging it still you know, as you're getting out in the world and doing things, because it is really so protective. Yeah, I mean, even if you got sick, if you started with- exactly. We have high doses when people get sick. We want to do mills of it when people get sick. We, we, when we've been treating our COVID patients with, um, we, we do high dose thymus and alpha in those patients. Um, do you do that IV or do you do that in-, in Well, mostly we just do it, I, we just have them do it as a, as a oh. substitute push, yeah. Okay. We just do it daily at home then. Okay, That's okay, we're on the precipice of another, rabbit hole so let's not <laughs> in the interest of respecting your time 
Um, I'm going to thank you a million times over for today. This was so great. It was great to meet you in person, Betsy. Great, you too. Thank you for having me. Right. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll, I'll talk to your people and we'll try to figure something else out. So we can talk again. Thanks, Ellen. Thank you so much. Well, wasn't that just a great episode? I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed recording it. Once again, to reach Dr. Elizabeth Yurt or to find out more about what she does, you can go to our website at thebolderlongevityinstitute.com. And to connect with me, you can find me on Instagram under Natalie Nidham, and you can find me on Facebook in the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Facebook group. It's a closed group. Just answer the questions, I'll let you in, and we have great conversations in there about peptides, biohacking, and all that great stuff. And if you did enjoy the show, please make sure to write a five-star review on iTunes and share it with anyone that you think could also benefit from it. Once again, thank you, and I look forward to seeing you again on our next episode.